Hey, this is Ryan Quinn. Welcome to 20 Minutes Underground. <laughs> Here, <Jake. laughs> Welcome to the third installment, 20 Minutes Underground with Underground Reptiles. Most of the episode today will be on geckos. I remember being a, a young lad the first time I saw a leopard gecko and looking at it and just looking and feeling the skin, how bumpy it was, yet it looks so smooth and this big bulbous, puffy, fleshy tail. Okay, one of the things that I really remember is how, as a kid, first seeing reptiles, especially the stuff that nobody else saw for the first time and me is so blown away. There was this feeling inside me that was just, I had to have one, man. No matter what I was going to do, I was going to have one. When I grow up, I was going to... And I think when you're in the business or you're in a pet store, I don't know if it's times. So that's a good question to ask one day. If it's just the, time, the, the, the place and time that we're at, they're, they're so readily available. But I remember seeing even the simple leopard gecko. I remember seeing a crested gecko the first time and found that it was from like New Caledonia and I was like, wow, what is it? I was so excited about seeing it. Now, how could I get, if I can kill the guy that had it and take it from him, I would have done it. Anyway, I hope you have that same feeling because that's how we do around here and everybody that works here is like that. We won't hire somebody who's not an animal person. Enjoy the show. Thank you again. Hey guys, this is Ryan B. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm going to be showing you guys our gecko facilities here at Underground Reptiles. Now, as you could probably see, this is not just any gecko facility. You're actually inside my garage. Well, my converted garage, that is. Now, I'm going to explain to you why we decided to do that here and the benefits of doing that in just a moment. But I first want to take you a look, take you around here, show you some of the different animals that we're breeding, some of the different geckos that we've uh, been able to breed here at Underground Reptiles, and even talk about some future projects that you guys might be enjoying. First up, take a quick look at our Lichianus. If you take a quick look here, this is one of our females. This is a pure new Anna Lichianus, and she's holding on to that branch. I absolutely love these geckos. These are one of the largest geckos in the world. Gorgeous coloration. If you want to start working with Lichianus, one thing to keep in mind. These guys will take about three to five years before they reach maturity. Okay, It's a uh, long commitment, but I tell you what, these are probably one of the coolest geckos around. Great temperaments on most of them. You do have the occasional one that can be somewhat aggressive, but all the ones we have here are real sweet, real tame. They've bred for us nicely. They produce a lot of babies for us. And these guys will produce for many years. Some say around 20, some say even longer than that. One future project, I'll show you guys real quickly. Another pair of Lichianus geckos. These are Mount Kogus. These are Grand Terre Type A Mount Kogus. This is the lighter phase for those of you guys that are familiar with the Grand Terre Type A, especially the Mount Kogus. You have two phases. You have a darker, you have what's called a dark morph, and then you've got the lighter phase. Gorgeous animals in Mount Kogus are one of the largest of the Lichianus geckos. I've got some younger. These are the super giant Sunglow Raptors. Some gorgeous animals. Believe it or not, this is actually a 2012. This, day, this, this animal was born this year. That's one of the ways we know that it's actually a super giant because it's already that size within less than a year. There's one of the sisters. And these are both are females. I've got in here an emerine tremper pet raptor. As you guys can see, it's got a regen tail on it. We've got a younger gargoyle gecko. This is a holdback. This is one that we're going to uh, start breeding here probably within the next six months or so. Should be ready for breeding. But if you look over here, 
got our Agricole or Agricoli geckos. Now, as I mentioned before, it's important to find both an animal that you can breed and an animal that you like. Okay, now this is an animal, I'll be 100% honest with you, we've been working with these guys for about a year now and haven't had any produce successfully, haven't had any eggs from these animals. I only got one pair that we're working with right now. But you know what, I gotta be honest with you, I just love these stinking animals so much that I'm just not really willing to, to move them on, you know? I'll give them another year, I'll give them another two years, maybe I'll just keep them even if they never produce, um, just because I like them so much. It's a neat animal, doesn't take up a lot of space, and so therefore, why, why get rid of it if you don't need to? Over here we've got some crested geckos. I'll show you this cage we actually have our pin projects in. Okay, you see some beautiful pinstripe cresteds here. Again, as you can see, no tail, okay? Not a big deal. My cameraman just got attacked by the crested, but it's okay. These guys do hop around a little bit. Beautiful crested geckos. We've got tons of them here. We're always producing them here at Underground Reptiles. A gorgeous yellow striped pair of gargoyle geckos. This is our male here. Really nice yellow coloration on him. Beautiful striping. Here's our female. Very nice retic. Now if she's looking a little skinny, that's because she just dropped some eggs for us last night. Pulled those out already. Got them incubating. Over here we've got some Chihua geckos. These are producing pairs of Chihua geckos. We've got a few of these. We're working with mainlands, primarily ones that have high amounts of reds. We're trying to produce some high red babies. These are all from European bloodlines. Here's a gravid female. I don't want to move her around too much. Very, very pretty Chihua geckos. Lastly, as I mentioned before, you guys notice that we're in a garage. And you say to yourself, Ryan, why are you using a garage? You know, why not uh, have like some state-of-the-art breeding facility? Why not uh, keep them in an air-conditioned facility? Well, this area is air-conditioned, but one of the things that we've noticed is important when producing any geckos, leopard geckos, rachidactylus geckos, any gecko, is offering them a period of time to cool down, okay? Kind of like a brumation. They don't quite hibernate like some of our tegus will, um, but they do slow down in their production. Right around now, it's uh, October. Um, we're actually about to hit November here. And uh, it's going to start cooling down, even in Florida. Now, the beautiful thing about Florida is it doesn't get really, really cold. You know, we're not going to hit zero degrees or minus, you know, something or other. Um, but it does get cool. By housing them in this garage that we've converted, though it's somewhat insulated, the walls are thinner. And so this area of the house gets cooler than the rest of my house. Okay? And so what it'll do is it'll lower the temperature in here by maybe 10, sometimes 15 degrees on a really cold night. It's perfect for these animals in creating a, um, a season of cooler weather for them so that they slow down their productions. The males have the opportunity to uh, reproduce uh, their sperm plugs. Um, females have an opportunity to uh, kind of relax from breeding for a bit, which is also very important. You don't want to overbreed your females and then you lose them within a year or two. That's not good as well. So by keeping them in this garage here, it provides that season for them. Guys, I hope this was informative for you. I hope you enjoyed walking around with us. Uh, be sure to stay tuned. I'll show you some more of our geckos. I'll show you some more tricks if you guys want to. Um, stay tuned. Comment. I hope you guys enjoyed. God bless. New segment on 20 Minutes Underground called Local Stuff. The reason it's called Local Stuff is not just because it's local in Florida, but it can be local anywhere. Because it's snakes like this, Diadophus, it's called a ringneck snake. And this is what got most of us into reptiles to begin with. Now first look at just a cheapy little snake and from an industry perspective, it's only a couple of bucks. But, and this happens to be a baby, but upon further look and, and more study, this is the most amazing animal. They're, first of all, they're the shiniest, blackest little thing. They got this beautiful orange ring. Everybody finds them everywhere in every garden. 
and they come in so much variety. Now, if you get this same snake up north, like where I, where I used to come from, I used to go upstate New York and catch these things. You can get these things two foot long. I remember the first time I caught one in Florida, I was like, man, that's a baby. And not knowing that the ones in Florida got small. But the few interesting facts about them is they're one of the few snakes that could actually put their teeth out sideways like this. So when you're holding them in your hand, he'll literally pull back and cut the side of your hand like little tiny razor blades. Also, it's suspected that they actually have uh, a slight venom so that when they're eating, they actually envenomate their prey. A really cool thing about them too is most people don't know what they eat. One of their favorite diets is other reptiles. They love eating baby garters and baby ribbons. I've actually caught these. When we go road hunting at night, we've actually caught them with baby snakes hanging out of there. The tails of the snakes, two and three tails hanging out of their mouth, sitting there stuffed on the road. Beautiful animals. And they even get better looking as they get older. And another cool thing about them is you notice that their tail, their belly is orange, but their tail is red. When you catch them and when you first get them, they're real nervous. Their tail curls up in a tight, tight little ring, almost like a, like a pseudo rattlesnake. Just the coolest little animals in the world. Easy to keep in captivity too if you can find the right food. But they're subterranean animals, they live underground most of the time. And I think they're one of the coolest things ever made. God is good. Since we're going to be talking about geckos this week, I thought it'd be a really great opportunity to talk about one of the tricks of the trade when it comes to uh, working and feeding with these geckos. Now, no matter what part of the industry you're in when it comes to reptiles or amphibian or other exotic animals, everybody's got their tricks of the trade. And one of the things I want to show you guys this week is how I prepare food for most of my Rachidactylus geckos. It's good for Cresteds, lychees, gargoyles, Saracen worms, Chihuahuas. I even use it on my Agricoli geckos. So, Watch here how I prepare the food. One of the first things I do is I use what's called fruit on the bottom yogurt. You can get it from any store. I get mine from Publix. It's a local grocery store here in Florida. But you can get it pretty much from any store out there. I get the fruit on the bottom. I get the regular yogurt. You don't want to use any of the ones that are like, uh, that have artificial sweeteners in it or, um, like reduce fat or no sugar. Try to get it as natural as, pro as, as possible. What I'll do first, I'll usually take like a berry, we use strawberry, banana, you can mix flavors, doesn't matter. Okay, we'll empty the contents into a bowl here. Try to get out all that good fruit flavoring, all that good natural fruit. It can sometimes get a little messy. Now you're going to want to empty about, I start off with about two cups and you can add if need be. You're going to know how many geckos or animals you have and you have to feed and you'll just adjust accordingly. The next aspect, crested gecko diet. Now, one of the biggest complaints when working with crested geckos or any other the Rachidactylus geckos is, man, I burn through this stuff like crazy. Well, by using the fruit on the bottom yogurt, it's going to carry how long you could use your crested gecko diet for. All right. Now, what I do, and unfortunately, I don't have exact measurements, but hopefully this gives you an idea about how much I use. What I'll do is I will cover, basically, the top of the yogurt generous portion on top. Now again, I've got a lot of geckos, and this isn't even gonna feed them all, but as you can tell, I probably use a lot more than most. Next, we go to our vitamins. Our vitamins are really important. I use a Super Cal Medium D3. I'm gonna take some of this, just sprinkle it over the top. Now some of you guys are probably wondering, well, why are you using the calcium with D3? You just use the yogurt. Now one of the reasons why we use the yogurt I didn't mention before, is because yogurt has in it calcium naturally, but then it's also high in protein, high in fat content. That's all great for having the animals gain weight or helping the animals to gain weight. If you've got a female that just laid eggs and lost some weight, also it helps in maintaining weight for them. Okay, so it's a really good source of protein, fat, and calcium, but I'll still use the calcium with D3 because the yogurt doesn't have a high amount of D3 in it, and I believe the animals still need some supply of D3. 
Also use Super Pig. Super Pig is a great vitamin and supplement to add to your uh, food when preparing for crested geckos or other rachidactylus geckos. Um, the reason why it's a pigment enhancer. I like using it. I've seen a difference. I've noticed a difference in my animals when using it. This one you can use a little bit more sparingly. Again, just sprinkle over the top. And then finally, I use a Reptivite. It has calcium and D3 in it, but also has some other vitamins which are essential for the animal. And again, just a little sprinkle over the top. Now, one of the things I use that I found out from a friend of mine is Pedialyte. I'll use both Pedialyte and water. Okay, the reason why we use Pedialyte is because when working with the animals, sometimes you'll notice that your Crested Gecko, maybe your Chihuahua, any of the other Rachidactylus geckos, has trouble shedding. Usually when they have trouble shedding, it's due to a lack of electrolytes. Pedialyte, the, non, the, the unflavored kind, you mix it in with the water, it adds electrolytes to the food, it helps the animals to maintain um, their shedding or keeping off their shedding or getting it off successfully. Now when adding the Pedialyte and the water, what you want to do, and you might have to do this a couple of times, is you want to watch out for uh, the consistency of the product here. What you don't want to do is create a real, real liquidy food. What you want it to be is a nice, like, thick, smoothy consistency. You don't want it too thick where it's like a paste. And I scrape the sides just to make sure we get all that good stuff in there. Just up. Doesn't look the most appetizing to us, but trust me when I tell you, these geckos heat it up like crazy. And what you want to do is you want to mix in all those powders. You don't want any real clumps of like powders. Now you'll still notice some clumps in there, some lumps. That's from the yogurt, it's from the fruit, okay? Especially my bigger lychees, man, they love eating that stuff. Big piece of fruit to chomp down on. Pedialyte, a little bit more water, and that right there is the perfect consistency, nice and thick, not too thick. Not too watery. Now I like making mine in Tupperware bins. Main reason why, I'll usually make more of this in one sitting. And what I could do with it is, let's say I, I make too much or you know I want to save some for it the, later on in the week. Put the lid on top, refrigerate it. It refrigerates nicely. Also recommend keeping your Crested Gecko diet, your Super Pig, even your vitamins you can refrigerate. Um, it just uh, increases the life on them. Um, usually we'll feed our geckos this, this mixture at least three times a week. And don't forget also insects are important, okay? We use crickets here. Also, if you follow me over here, in keeping with ease, we also produce our own roaches, okay? Roaches can be kept alive, put some egg crate in there. See there are some of the bigger ones, you got lots of little babies in there. Right now we're letting this colony get back up to size. I use a substrate at the bottom. Okay, the babies will also burrow in there. All right, and you feed them things like leftover dog food, greens, fruits, okay? One of the things we do here, if you notice, we'll rub uh, Vaseline along the sides. This helps make sure that roaches don't escape. If you got a fear of roaches and you don't want a roach infestation in your house, make sure you use the Vaseline. Put a couple holes on the sides above the Vaseline. Again, that way the animals can't escape through those holes. Make sure you got a nice tight lid on it. Feed them like once a week or so. And pull the roaches out when you need them. I hope you guys enjoyed that and uh, hope you guys keep staying tuned for some more tricks of the trade. Thank you.
Question of the week from Bob Jones in Jibip, Michigan. Why don't we take deposits on our animals? Excellent question. We'll take deposits if we have an animal and you're short on cash and you need to pass in a couple weeks. That's no problem. But we don't take animals that are not produced yet. A lot of companies will take animals. Like, I've got so much demand for the tegus, thank God, thank you, thanks to you guys who, who love our tegus. But I don't have any right now. And I'm not going to take deposits on an animal that I might have. Because if I don't get them, then I owe you money and I can't stand owing people money. So we do appreciate you guys who want to put down money on stuff that we don't have yet. But we don't take it because I think it's bad business. Thanks again for your question. If you have more, feel free to send them in the comments section. God bless. Hey, this is Moody Booty here at Underground Reptiles, a.k.a. Diaper Rash, a.k.a. Let's Move On. Anyways, we picked your three winners for the comment section. We appreciate everybody's comments. We got our three winners this week. You guys are getting t-shirts. Hope you enjoy. If you don't like them, be sure to write us at info I don't give a crap reptiles.com. Moving on. First comment comes from Shade Star. He writes us, you guys are awesome. Ha ha. Another great video from Underground. As to the question about venomoid snakes, I'm completely against it. Really, completely? If you have a venomous snake in your collection, it should be either to gather its venom to create life-saving anti-venom or to appreciate the snake's natural beauty. Making a snake venomoid benefits the snake in no way. People who have the snakes defanged or venomoid are putting themselves before their snakes. But that's just my opinion. My opinion is, great comment, don't put yourself before your snakes. Very true, Shade Star. Our next comment comes all the way from Intriguing. Let me get these chips out of the way. You guys always catch me while I'm eating. The next comment comes from Intrigued Gaming. I believe there's nothing wrong with Venomoids. Let's say you've owned a venomous snake. Big responsibility. And you had a lifestyle change. That's weird and could not care for the snake as much as you need to, I would be in favor of getting the venom glands out of the snake if you were to have someone else care for the snake because you could not handle the responsibility. Assuming you had nobody to give the snake to because they didn't have a license and or was not experienced with venomous snakes. There's a second part here, guys. This guy's a little long-winded here. He continues. You could have them watch the snake for you meanwhile. You found someone to care for the snake. I also believe you should take the venom glands out of a snake if you have children in your house or other mascots. Who the heck keeps mascots in the house? Anyways, that could be in danger if the snake were to get out. Lastly, I believe if you have Notice the strong change in aggression in the snake and feel as if your safety is compromised when you handle it You should take the venom glands out Whatever Moving on and my favorite comment of the week If I could give you an extra prize you would be the winner here This comment goes out to my very good friend inbred Ned Michael Moa writes, can I keep inbred Ned as a pet? Well, Michael, that depends. Inbred eats a lot. Can you feed him? Inbred also has special needs. Can you take care of them? Can you take care of those needs? Sorry, I made myself chuckle there. <laughs> you get it as a fat joke at my expense. Shut up, inbred. This is my time to shine. In any case, well, Michael, great comment. You're getting a t-shirt. Everybody, good comments. Keep them coming to me so that I can read them on this video camera device and so that I can make fun of them or I could get a good laugh at the, out of them or we just enjoy them. You will win prizes. I promise. Keep them coming. Thank you, Underground Reptiles, and your good friend, Bodhi Bodhi. Thank you. Boom. Oh, my nuts.
Thanks for joining us at 20 Minutes Underground. We hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, food for thought. And in case you haven't noticed, uh, we're going to take a few of the best comments and we're going to send you some free gifts. This week's open-ended food for thought question of the week, as it would be, is what's your thoughts on industrial setups versus species specific. Some people they have the vision cages and they got the nice paper and the water bowls and everything. Other people they like to have uh, the natural bottom terrarium with the waterfalls running. I mean do you have an opinion on that? What do you like as far as setups go and what do you think is better? Does the animal feel more comfortable in one? Does he not feel in the other? Because trying to keep in mind trying to set up a uh, uh, an environment like outside is virtually impossible. So do you go completely the other way and only give him his necessities? Or do you try to give him a little bit of what he might find in the, in the wild? Just a thought. We want to know your comments. Again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bless.